All right. If everyone wants to find a seat, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome everyone to our weekly orthopedic surgery grand rounds. Uh, one announcement, um, just a reminder, we do have residency interviews next Thursday and Friday. Uh, those are always, I think, really exciting days to uh, be able to speak with the applicants, showcase our program, um, and really important days to make sure that we continue to uh, recruit outstanding residents. So um, thank you to everyone who's interviewing, everybody who's participating, but um, should be two good days next week. Um, and then for our speaker today, so we have Dr. Joey Sheridan. Uh, so Dr. Sheridan is one of our fourth year residents here at UCSF. Uh, he's originally from Arizona. Uh, he excelled as a high school basketball player and holds the uh, second all-time record in three-pointers made. Um, originally from Arizona, he went to University of San Diego for um, undergrad and then came to UCSF for medical school. Um, he did research with our department, uh, was part of the Hyman Summer Research Fellowship, uh, really excelled as a medical student. We were fortunate to have him match with us here at UCSF. Um, he has continued along a path of excellence while um, during his residency. Uh, he received the Crevins Award um, as the Outstanding Intern of the Year. Um, he was awarded as the uh, Emergency Department Consul Resident of the Year in 2023. Um, he's also performed um, research on upper extremity injuries and has um, a special interest in um, athletic um, upper extremity injuries. Uh, he is uh, looking towards a career in hand and upper extremity surgery and applying for fellowships currently. Uh, but he will be speaking to us today on ergonomics and orthopedics, uh, improving surgeon durability and career longevity. So Dr. Sheridan, thank you and look forward to your talk. All right. Thanks, Dr. Lansdowne. Um, so I'll be talking about ergonomics and orthopedics and specifically how this can impact durability of surgeons and ultimately uh, career longevity. Um, I have no disclosures. Um, so just some objectives for the talk. We'll go through a little bit of the history of ergonomics. Um, we'll talk about the prevalence of occupational musculoskeletal pain and injuries in surgeons and some strategies and solutions, hopefully to mitigate pain and injury and keep us in the OR longer and, and pain-free. <clears throat> so just a, a quick moment on why I chose this topic. Um, you know, as I progressed throughout residency and spent more and more time in the OR, you really gain an appreciation of how physically demanding this job can be. Um, and any job that requires labor and physical exertion does come with aches and pains and uh, over time does take a toll on your body. Um, and what this does is put you at risk for injury and um, put your career longevity at risk as well. Um, so after some of the more physically demanding cases or some long weekends on call, um, you, you can really start to feel like one of those cartoons from uh, an icy hot commercial uh, with lots of aches and pains. So. Um, what I learned was that the, the pain that I was experiencing was directly linked to the, the work that I was doing in the OR. So neck pain from looking down for long hours, uh, low back pain from poor posture and standing with lead for long cases, um, hand wrists and elbow pain from instrumentation. Um, but overall, it wasn't just the pain and aches that, uh, that bothered me, but it was how early it was starting. Um, and the last thing I wanted was to let my own musculoskeletal pain and injury get in the way of uh, you know, my ability to treat others. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the work we get to do is special and personally, I want to do it for a long time. So I set out uh, to learn a little bit more about career longevity and what, what can make a long career. <clears throat> so in, in looking around the internet and just kind of the little a press on what job longevity and career longevity mean, um, you know, I was pretty dissatisfied with some of the answers that I found. Uh, so th these are just some screenshots of, um, non-medical articles online describing job and career longevity. Um, on the top, it defined job longevity as a long existence or service, uh, and career longevity is the job or profession that you do for a long period of your life. Um, and I, I felt these were really limited and don't truly encompass what it means to have a long and fulfilling career. And, you know, it's not just about how many years we can get through this and get to the finish line, um, but how we can enjoy this work and do it for a long time and perform at a high level. Um, so before looking deeply into our own profession, um, I think we can learn a little bit more from other physically demanding careers and what this really means and how to achieve it. Um, and although it may be a little bit of a stretch to compare us all to professional athletes, uh, there was a lot of actually interesting literature out there from other surgical subspecialties um, that drew some interesting parallels uh, between surgeons and the life of an athlete. Um, most of them arguing that surgeons require the, the mental acuity, physical dexterity, and skill and situational awareness, you know, similar to high performance athletes. 
and both professions require lifestyle dedication to your craft um, and um, objective performance review and a balance of training and performance as well. Um, and another key aspect of the life of both athletes and surgeons is we simply can't do our jobs if we're injured or in too much pain to do them. Um, and since athletes spend a significant amount of time focused on injury prevention, I think so, so can we. <clears throat> so you're probably wondering how I managed to work in a slide with LeBron James into the top, but um, I truly think there's no better example right now in any profession of um, career longevity. So on the left, this is LeBron in, in 2003 on his debut season uh, in Sacramento playing the Kings. And on the right is exactly 20 years later to the day, um, still performing at a, at a high level. So LeBron is undoubtedly one of the greatest basketball players of all time, but I think what really sets him apart from other basketball legends and other great athletes is his unparalleled longevity. And the main reason why he continues to, to play at a high level and gets to experience these amazing moments is because he's put a lot of thought and commitment into injury prevention. Um, so what do athletes do to protect themselves and um, how can we implement this into to our lives? I think, you know, LeBron and other lead athletes, they simply just invest a lot of time and energy um, into sports science and maintaining their bodies at peak condition. Um, and reading through many articles on sports science and injury prevention and in athletes, um, I really noticed three common themes um, across the board that I felt that we could utilize in our own careers. And these were physical durability, uh, proprioception or awareness, and technique. Um, so physical durability, this is just referring to the body's natural ability to sustain short-term damage and long-term strain. And obviously there's uh, a lot of components to this, including genetics, but uh, LeBron and other high-level athletes are successful because they receive the proper, you know, training, rest, recovery, and treatment that, that keeps them in play. And, you know, obviously these athletes have the luxury of time and, and resources to invest in this, but I'll bring up some examples later in the talk of how surgeons can do this as well. Um, and still maintain their bodies even within a, a busy schedule. Um, so next is proprioception awareness. And as, as we all know, proprioception is the ability to perceive your body's position in space. Um, for athletes, this is really, you know, avoiding landing on another player's ankle or avoiding positions that put you at high risk for injury. Um, but for us, I think it's also critical to think about how we're moving our bodies, where our bodies are in space, and which positions do put us at high risk for injury as well. And I'll discuss that in more detail later. Um, so technique, I think, is the most important um, and plays the ultimate role in injury prevention, especially for us. Um, when you're repeating the same motions over and over, um, you're putting a lot of strain on certain parts of the body, and it's really important to have perfect technique. So we've seen players destined for greatness like Derek Rose, you know, plagued with injury because of improper landing technique. Um, and then other uh, recent examples on the right here is uh, that's Josh Green. He's a guard for the Dallas Mavericks. Um, and he's currently been battling uh, elbow UCL injury and has strained it over and over again. And he was recently asked in a, in a press interview, um, you know, why does he keep getting hurt? And simply put, he goes, I guess I put my elbows in weird positions and weird stuff happens to them. Um, so even though it's plainly put, I think he makes a really excellent point that he was injured because there was something that he could control. You know, his technique wasn't perfect and he didn't start working on this early on. And unfortunately it's kept him out of, out of the game. Um, so how do we implement this into our lives, into our careers as orthopedic surgeons? So to be honest, the answers were pretty difficult to find in the orthopedic literature. Um, this is just kind of a representation of my literature review. Um, so using mesh terms, orthopedic surgeon and career length or orthopedic surgeon and career longevity, I really came up with nothing. Um, most of the data that's out there, which I'll go through, simply describes risk factors, prevalence of injury, um, but there's not a lot of discussion on concrete steps to move forward and, and changes to make to, to keep us in the OR without injury and pain-free. <clears throat> so this is where I felt a deep dive into ergonomics could play a pretty productive role for all of us. Uh, so we'll take a step back and just look into the history of ergonomics. Um, ergonomics was uh, a term that was coined from the Greek roots ergon, which means work and nomos, which means custom or law. And it's defined as the interdisciplinary scientific approach to problems of adjusting work to humans, aiming to increase productivity, work safety, and the humanization of labor. And this is a concept that is not new. It's been around for a long time and even dates as far back as Hippocrates. So these are extracts from um, Hippocrates, uh, one of his texts um, labeled about the hospital. 
Um, and even he uh, felt the importance of talking about protecting the surgeon and making sure in their most comfortable position. So he quoted, the surgeon can be standing or sitting, depending on the type of operation, but should always be in the most comfortable posture. Um, he also goes on to describe the optimal position of light to facilitate surgeon position and also goes on to describe tools um, and how they should have the proper shape and size, uh, weight and construction to promote the ease of use. And mind you, this is in ancient Greece where there weren't a lot of work regulations happening at the time, but he still understood the importance of optimizing a surgeon's comfort and, and positioning. Uh, so fast forward to around the 1700s, another critical historic figure was uh, Bernard, uh, Bernardino Ramazzini. Um, and he was actually the first physician who studied diseases that were caused in the workplace. Um, so he spoke to his patients and noticed that a lot of them did have symptoms uh, related to their profession. And in 1713, he published uh, De Morbus Artificum, or Diseases of Workers. Um, so in this journal, he was the first to describe uh, injuries like writer's cramp or telegrapher's wrist, uh, housemaid's knee, and he outlined how these injuries were, were from people's professions. And then uh, fast forward for even further to World War II, and this is where ergonomics really gained a lot of attention. Um, uh, so during the war, uh, the, the war effort required soldiers and operators to use a, a new variety of complex equipment, um, ranging from aircraft and tanks to radar. And uh, this put a lot of demand on these soldiers and operators, and um, this led to higher cognitive and physical workloads um, for these people. And uh, this really forced people to think about positioning and safe work environments and uh, really laid the foundation for ergonomics as a discipline. So how do we apply this to, to our lives as orthopedic surgeons? Well, you know, surgeons and orthopedic surgeons in general are exposed to pretty hazardous day-to-day -day working environments. Uh, we have risks of exposure to infection, radiation, smoke, chemicals, uh, and musculoskeletal injuries. And when the primary focus is appropriately placed on the patient, uh, it's pretty easy to overlook these real physical threats. Um, and the literature shows us that we really have not implemented ergonomics uh, well into our own field. Um, so we've all been in positions like this before, um, but this is just one example of uh, putting your body at uh, many high-risk positions for many parts of the body. So this is a figure of a, an orthopedic surgeon at some point uh, in a total hip arthroplasty, but you can see his upper arm is raised and abducted. The neck and lower back are twisted and bent. Wrist is twisted and bent and um, performing repetitive movements, all, all of which are uh, unergonomic and high-risk positions to be in. So <clears throat> um, I think this is just one example to, to highlight that we do this often, and oftentimes it is unavoidable, but hopefully today it can just shed some light on the risks it poses to our career um, and like, specifically longevity of our career and how to protect ourselves. Um, so the other thing I noticed is there really wasn't a, a single subspecialty that was safe. Um, and every, everyone seems to be at risk. So we'll go through, you know, many of the subspecialty studies of uh, musculoskeletal injury. Um, so this was a survey study from members of the OTA. Um, so they had uh, 86 trauma surgeons complete this survey. And uh, more than 66% of people responded that a musculoskeletal disorder was um, uh, related to work that they experienced. Um, it's a little bit hard to see in the text, but most common being low back pain, uh, wrist and forearm tendonitis, lateral epicondylitis, plantar fasciitis, carpal tunnel syndrome, and you know the list goes on. Um, but what they found is that the number of body regions involved and the number of years in practice were both risk factors for uh, developing musculoskeletal occupational injury. Um, the figure to the right I, I thought was interesting, and uh, what this shows is that with increasing age, you have a higher percentage of respondents that are reporting injuries, uh, with an increasing proportion of these respondents needing time off of work. Um, so if you look at the 56 to 65 degree range, um, although the, the raw numbers are low, uh, almost half the respondents that had injuries in this age group required time off of work. And I know many of us hope to have careers that last this long. So I think it just highlights the importance of thinking about this early on and thinking about longevity early on to keep you safe and uh, uninjured. Um, looking into the adult reconstructive world, um, this is a, uh, a survey study of 183 arthroplasty surgeons, uh, and they also found about 66% uh, reported a work-related injury. Um, notably for them, 31% uh, of surgeons actually required surgery for the injury that they sustained at work. Um, and most common injuries were in a similar distribution for them, um, but low back pain, lateral epicondylitis, shoulder tendonitis and impingement, and lumbar disc herniation, all, all being most common. 
Um, what they found was that uh, age above 55 or doing over 100 arthroplasty procedures a year um, were independent risk factors for sustaining an injury at work. I'm um, looking into the uh, orthopedic oncology world. This is a study of uh, 67 orthopedic oncologists, and they had a, a pretty high reported occupational injury rate of 84%. Um, they found you know, similar distribution, low back pain, lumbar disc herniation, uh, shoulder tendonitis, and lateral epicondylitis all, all being common. Um, they had almost half of respondents with injuries actually requiring surgery for their injury. Um, and about a third uh, of others uh, required time off of work. Um, an interesting point in their article um, is that uh, half of their respondents reported psychological effects of work as well. And, you know, burnout is a, a separate topic of its own, but um, the article touched on how the physical pain did have an impact on uh, psychological uh, well being as well. So the two are related, um, but they brought up an interesting point that, that it affects us mentally and physically. Um, and looking into uh, spine surgeons, this is a study uh, published by our very own Dr. Diab, uh, but quite a large series of, of spine surgeons uh, surveyed here. 561 uh, responded to the survey. Um, they found a high rate of neck pain, lumbar, lumbar and cervical disc herniation, and cuff disease, but also noted varicose veins and peripheral edema in about 20% of their respondents and lateral epicondylitis as well. Um, they had a, quite a high rate for uh, disc herniation, both on the lumbar and cervical spine of about seven and 4.6% respectively, um, which is, you know, not a low number of people given that they had over 500 people respond. Um, and interestingly, they found that uh, the total number of cases was a risk factor for neck pain and edema in the lower extremities. Um, but the type of surgery um, being spinal deformity surgery actually correlated with upper extremity injuries as well. So just a point that there's a lot of differences in within orthopedics and what we all do and um, each subspecialty does have its own risks to think about also. Uh, and now this is also a figure from that study that um, I found a little bit concerning, but it's uh, essentially showing you the number of surgeons that missed work uh, broken down by the type of injury. And there were three separate injuries uh, being neck pain and low back pain with radiculopathy and hand and finger pain um, that seemed to cause early retirement for these surgeons. So Again, I think just highlights the importance of thinking about this early on and preventing injury um, to keep you, you know, working pain free. Um, and then for those of us who uh, will spend much, much of our career sitting down uh, doing surgery, we're unfortunately not spared from ergonomic risk as well. Um, so this was a study of uh, 96 um, upper extremity, both hand and plastic surgeons um, that uh, responded to the study, and they reported about 71.9% um, had discomfort due to, due to their profession. Um, for upper extremity surgeons, uh, the distribution of injury is a little bit different, as you can imagine. Um, they reported more pain and stiffness in the neck and wrist and hand regions. Um, and 38 or sorry, 34% of respondents, uh, worried that these pain and symptoms will hinder their ability to perform surgery in the future. Um, about 60% had to receive treatment and 43% had to decrease their workload, uh, due to these injuries. Um, another important note is that this is uh, not only affecting surgeons that have many years of practice. Many of these studies showed risk factors for being, you know, more years in practice uh, puts you at higher risk for injury. But um, uh, this study of, of residents shows that it, it happens early on as well. So 76 residents uh, completed this survey um, and 97% uh, reported that they experienced procedural related pain. Um, again, similar distribution of low back, neck and um, lower extremity pain being most common, um, but they also found a, a positive association between higher pain scores and uh, lower work satisfaction, burnout, and callousness towards others. Um, they, they also queried uh, how this affected resident behavior and, and found uh, you know, significant associations with, um, with pain scores and increased over-the-counter medication use, uh, decreased stamina and concentration, and, and more irritability. Um, uh, this is also a figure from that study that I also found a little bit concerning. So um, this is uh, describing things that residents do when they're experiencing procedural related pain, how they adjust. Um, unfortunately, ignore it was much higher than simple things like changing the height of the surgical field or simply just uh, getting a surgical mat. Um, and I'm definitely guilty of this myself, but I think it just highlights that we need to think more about how we're interacting with our environment at work. Um, and there are some sim very simple things that we can do to protect ourselves that 
uh, seemed minimal at the time, but uh, over a long career in many cases and many hours in the operating room make a difference. Um, so going even further beyond resident experience, the, uh, this was a study from uh, Duke Medical Students um, where they had about almost 250 students respond to uh, the survey describing three quarters of them reporting pain, musculoskeletal pain during their surgery rotation. Um, they reported the most common um, uh, pain areas were the feet and the low back and while standing in the operating room and retracting. Um, but uh, I think the more concerning part about the study was that they, they spoke to these students and asked the ones who initially came in to medical school with surgical interests who, for whatever reason, decided to change into something non-surgical. Um, and about 36% of them reported the physical demands of the field being a common deterrent of why they did not go into a surgical profession. Um, so I think it's just uh, unfortunate that this is a reason why, you know, people are deterred from such a great job, um, just being the physical burden um, simply of, of operating. So given that, uh, you know, this seems to be something that affects surgeons of all ages, all spe subspecialties, um, I started looking for more evidence of, of risk factors of what specific things are, are really causing pain and injury. Um, and once we define risk factors, we can, you know, come up with solutions and target them. Um, so this was a study from JMS Surgery where they actually had surgeons operate with um, wearable motion uh, positional sensors, uh, which they had on their head, their torso, and, and their arms. Um, and what they did was uh, evaluate where their, these, you know, areas of the body were in space throughout the case. Um, and after processing, they kind of calculated ergonomic risk by um, defining how much of the case or what percentage of time in the case uh, these surgeons were in high risk, uh, medium risk, or low risk positions. Um, and the way that they defined high risk, um, which I appreciated was actually based off of other ergonomic occupational research that had associations with uh, increased risk uh, for injury. Um, so they had about uh, 50 surgeons or so uh, wear these monitors, um, all sorts of subspecialties um, within general surgery. Um, but they went uh, underwent continuous recording for about 115 cases. Uh, and overall, they found 65% of the time while operating, the neck was in a, a high-risk position. Um, the torso, about 30%, and shoulders, about 11% of the time were in high-risk positions um, during the span of all of those cases that were recorded. <clears throat> Um, interestingly, they found uh, the use of loops and headlights were both separately independently associated with uh, surgeon reported pain and the, the time in these unfavorable positions. Um, so those, again, I think are areas that we can target for improvement. Um, other risk factors that they found included longer case length um, and increased years in practice, which we've seen in other studies as well. Um, other risk factors to think about is that you know, not, not all people are the same and surgeon, surgeons come in all, all shapes and sizes. And, um, there are simply just different people that are at different risk. Um, so this is a study of, uh, female only arthroplasty surgeons, uh, who reported very high rates of uh, mostly upper extremity pain and injury. So almost 80% reported forearm wrist hand, uh, pain from operating, um, as well as about half of them had shoulder pain. And again, a high rate of low back pain as well. Um, and this is a, a much different distribution of of injuries when we looked at arthroplasty surgeons um, in that prior study, which uh, were mostly men. Um, but I, I think it just shows that, you know, instrumentation and the way the ORs are set up are not always meant for everybody. And interestingly, in the discussion, they, they brought up another article where uh, general surgeons had um, asked people their glove sizes and, and looked at, you know, kind of the urban ergonomics of the laparoscopic instruments. And they found that actually a glove size of six and a half or smaller um, uh, led to more difficulty using those instruments. So you can imagine this translate, translates into orthopedics as well. Um, so what can we do? Uh, we've identified risk factors and we know there's a high prevalence of injury for us. Um, so what are the ways that we can protect ourselves? So I, I broke this down into things that we can do inside the operating room and things that we can do outside of the operating room. Um, and so hopefully we can all take something away both inside and outside of the OR to, to protect ourselves a little bit better. Um, so inside the OR, this was a, a very useful and short um, and, you know, informing video that I recommend everybody watch. It, it's on YouTube. Um, but basically, they're describing ways inside the OR to protect yourselves. And they go through the most common ergonomic pitfalls for all surgeons. Uh, and what they described was that forward head posture, shoulder elevation, and uh, weight-bearing asymmetry were the, the most um, high-risk uh, positions or what 
what surgeons, um, you know, aired the most in ergonomically. Um, so for a forward head posture, um, this can really accelerate degenerative changes in the spine, uh, especially the cervical spine. And for every inch that the head moves forward in space, um, the, the relative weight of your head increases by about 10 pounds. So uh, it may not seem like a big deal, you know, an inch or two, but over the case of two, three, four, five hour cases, and then you add on 10 to 20 years of a career, you can really put yourself at risk for, for cervical uh, injury. Um, so their recommendation was to try to develop these um, postural resets. So just try to think from time to time about where, you, where your head is in space um, and, you know, adjust as needed. So for forward head posture, it's quite simple. Just try to keep it up over your body and stop leaning forward as much. Um, for shoulder elevation, you know, this position, it requires a lot of workload from delts and traps. Um, it predisposes to fatigue and pain and uh, can worsen dexterity and, um, you know, makes joint transmission across the elbows, wrists, and hands uh, a lot more difficult when your shoulders are elevated. Um, so the, the postural reset here is quite simple. It's just drop, drop your shoulders or bring the table down or get a step if you need. Um, for weight-bearing asymmetry, um, surgeons, you know, we commonly do this. We lean from one side to the other. Um, this, I, this was an interesting study where, you know, they had a bunny suit and somebody, you know, simulating a surgery just to show the exact position. Um, but this is something we do a lot and we shift our weight and we lean cause our feet start to hurt, but it can really put excessive load on the pelvis and hips. Um, so thankfully they, they gave us good examples as well. Um, so feet, uh, hip, hip width apart. And if you need to, you know, adjust your feet start to hurt, uh, you need to adjust, you know, one leg or the other, you can simply use a step. Um, and that'll keep you the pelvis level. Um, so this was an article that was published by uh, cardiothoracic surgeons that I really appreciated because they actually implemented um, OSHA guidelines, which is the, the U.S. Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Um, so they use those guidelines to create formal recommendations for surgeons while they're operating. Um, so for the head and neck, they recommended keeping the head vertical and not tilted more than 15 degrees. Uh, for the back, just stand or sit upright without bending into extreme positions. And for the torso, especially limit um, from 6 to 10 degrees from vertical to avoid excessive load. Um, for your arms, again, just hang at the side of the body. Try not to be, you know, operating in the field too far away from your hands. Uh, and the hand should be vertically between the waist and the, mid and the middle of the chest. And it's really to avoid elbow hyperflexion. Um, and then, of course, standing upright. Um, and shifting your weight occasionally from one leg to the other, but um, keeping in mind, you know, kind of the, the, the pelvis and that you're not shifting too much load one way or the other. Um, in the discussion, you know, they described how we have so many systems in the OR to keep, uh, you know, surgical complications from happening and keep patients safe. And I think we could do a little bit better and it only takes a little bit of time to develop some guidelines and help us with technique to protect ourselves as well. Um, so loops, I know um, a lot of us use loops, and I think they deserve special attention. And it's because a lot of subspecialties use them, um, and we re rely on them pretty heavily. Um, but as we've seen in other studies, they're an independent risk factor for time spent in these high-risk positions. Um, so uh, in thinking about kind of the anatomy of loops, um, you know, there's a, a lot of uh, varieties of how loops come and weight, light source options, uh, working distance. And I think when you're being fit for these, all of these should be optimized to obviously help us visualize the surgical field, but for comfort as well. Um, so optimizing working distance and using higher declination angles. So loops that have a, a higher angle looking down. Um, so you're minimizing neck flexion is, is really important. Um, so the difficulty I think here is that we're often fit for these outside of the OR. Um, and we're often fit for them early in, in training when we're not quite sure what works best for us. So uh, we pay a lot of money for them and uh, the reps are willing to help us. So if you're having pain, you know, maybe speak with the rep and have things adjusted to, to protect yourself. Um, and again, I think uh, loops are important, but if you can, the microscope has actually been shown in a couple of studies to um, allow surgeons to be more ergonomically correct. So use the microscope when you're able to. Um, it can be, you know, freely adjusted to, to fit your comfort. Um, and again, for those of us sitting down a lot of the time in surgery, um, quite simple, the best seated position are your feet flat on the floor, knees at 90 degrees, uh, and keeping the surgical field at about, you know, level or 10 centimeters below elbow height. And again, this is to, to minimize elbow hyperflexion. Um, another interesting area um, for upper extremity surgeons that has been looked at is um, biofeedback devices. So uh, this was an article published by um, plastic surgeons. 
um, who studied a device that sits at the base of the cervical spine on the skin. Um, and what it does is it'll give you feedback when you're deviating from your normal posture. Um, and what they found was when they compared the same participant that was uh, doing the same procedure without the device, um, they found that 72% of participants actually spent more time in the ergonomically correct position. So this, I think, is just another area of um, you know, innovation that we can look at to, to help protect, um, to protect ourselves. Um, another uh, thing inside of the OR that I think um, a couple of studies have brought up are uh, intraoperative microbreaks, and I know Ellen touched a bit on this in her grand rounds as well, but um, this is a study, a multi-center study from uh, four separate centers that looked at uh, using targeted stretching microbreaks uh, during surgery um, uh, to minimize pain both in the OR and outside of the OR after the procedure. Um, so what they did was have uh, surgeons undergo one day uh, of an OR day without implementing these targeted breaks and then another day while using these targeted stretching micro breaks. Um, the intervals seemed you know, quite frequent. It, they did them at 20 and 40 minute intervals throughout the whole case. Um, but I think this is something that obviously could be adjusted to, to fit the, de the demands of the case and what's going on in the, in the surgery. Um, but this was from their appendix, just looking at what they did. Um, again, quite simple, um, looking at, you know, neck stretches, uh, shoulder rolls, uh, stretching out your lower back, your wrists, your ankles, um, all while maintaining sterility as well. Um, so they had 66 surgeons complete uh, 193 cases without these breaks and about 150 with, with them. Um, and what they found was that the post-procedure pain scores in the neck, the back, the shoulders, the wrists, the hands, and the ankles uh, were all significantly better after just implementing these, these short breaks throughout the case. Um, interestingly, they found that the duration of the case did not differ, even though they were doing this every 20 to, you know, 20 to 40 minutes. Um, and then the perceived improvements in uh, performance during the case, mental focus were also improved as well. And um, about 87% of them uh, reported that they're going to continue to do this in their practice. Um, so for sake of time, I didn't go into all of the ergonomic details of instrumentation, but I think this is an area that, you know, deserves further focus and uh, really an area that we can um, implement some innovation as well from our end. Um, but um, as of now, the, the ergonomic recommendations for instrumentation are keeping your wrist in neutral position, um, if available, wider or T-shaped handles, um, increased diameter of tools, and then when you can, automatic impactors and, and power screwdrivers um, just to protect your, your upper extremities. Um, and, you know, tools are not often designed for our benefit. Um, it can really increase the risk of, you know, CMC joint, arthritis, tendinopathies, and trap neuropathies. Um, so I think this is an area that we can help ourselves a lot. And how about outside of the operating room? So um, I think this is also important to think about because we know there's just times in the case where you have to bend down and look into a deep hole and you have to wear a headlight, a headlamp and loops. Um, so I think it's um, comforting to know that there seems to be some evidence that things you do outside of the operating room can protect us as well. Um, so this was a, an article published last year in a urology, urology journal. Um, so what they did was describe an exercise regimen uh, that was developed to, targeted, uh, to target hunch posture in the OR. Um, so they described a hunch posture results in kyphosis, cervical flexion, scapular protraction, all things that we've discussed put us at high risk of injury. Um, so uh, an ideal regimen was developed um, in order to, to work on these areas. And what they implemented was um, exercises that focused on posterior chain stability, scapular retraction, and core strength. Um, and, uh, the authors went on to describe also that, you know, uh, a lot of us, you know, go to the gym and work out, but just general resistance training is not always helpful and does not help us with these postural muscles where we're standing for long hours at a time. So those bicep curls aren't always, you know, helping us for these long cases, unfortunately. Um, but what they did was create a, a streamlined, you know, strength and flexibility regimen that surgeons most importantly can do during the work week. Um, so here's just an example of, uh, their regimen and notably you don't need any equipment other than what looks like kind of a resistance band. Um, but this is just a look at their targeted workout. Um, and what I appreciate about the study was they, uh, also conducted a study of feasibility as well. Um, so they had 21 surgeons, uh, undergo about six sessions each, and they demonstrated that the regimen can be completed within 15 minutes and done three times a week. So it's something easy that we can all do. And I'm happy to send this out to anyone that's interested. 
Um, but um, another another thing that they also you know query these surgeons are the likelihood that they will do this in the future, and uh, they all said yes. Um, so just an easy thing to do again to protect yourself. Um, so this was a, uh, another study uh, published by plastic surgeons, but brings up an important uh, point that us as orthopedic surgeons, we have very close colleagues in physical therapy that can help us. Um, so they collaborated with physical therapists to design a study um, to directly treat any problematic areas for surgeons. And again, they came up with nice concrete, you know, workout regimens and uh, developed videos as well that I can share. Um, but all again, very simple, very easy to do. Um, and, um, you know, targeting areas that typically are what put us out of work or, or provide pain for us from operating. Um, so there, there was not a lot in the orthopedic literature about um, micro breaks or, you know, exercise regimen, but this was one of them. Um, so this was a, a pilot study of an uh, Italian orthopedic surgeons um, where they had an ergonomic program designed for them to reduce pain from procedures. Um, they were actually followed by PT for about three months. Um, poor postures were recorded and, you know, they focused on areas that they um, were either weak or, you know, putting themselves at high risk. Um, so they had an intervention group that kind of was followed by physical therapy and underwent an education program uh, and then a con control group as well. Um, and they performed exercises before and after the case. And then if they were in a clinic day or not operating, they would do these twice a day. Um, and then uh, this figure here shows the difference between the post-operative surgeon pain and um, between the intervention group and the control group. Uh, so the intervention group is there in blue uh, in the control in purple. And they have time one and time two after this three-month program. And, and they can, uh, what they found was pretty significant improvements in low back pain uh, and pain in the lower extremity, the knees, ankles, and feet. So seems to work. And again, many of them said they'll continue to do this in their practice. Um, so future directions, I think, you know, a, a further understanding of unique risks for different subspecialties. Um, as I said, a, a lot of us do, um, you know, quite different procedures and, and use different muscles and have different case lengths. So uh, understanding the, the ailments of each subspecialty can help us target um, ways to protect ourselves within each subspecialty. Um, we should also uh, talk about early education. Um, there was a study that I didn't bring up, but um, uh, all of the orthopedic program directors were were asked if ergonomics was part of their core curriculum. And there's only two out of about 130 that responded that had a formal curriculum. Um, so I think this is an area that we should target early on. Um, if we learn good habits early, we can, you know, have longer careers. Um, and again, I think a multidisciplinary approach, we have um, a lot of wonderful physical therapists that we work with that can help us out um, and develop ergonomic principles and programs for us if we're having pain. So in summary, you know, musculoskeletal occupational injuries um, are highly prevalent, and unfortunately, they do put us out of work. Um, a good amount of them did require surgery for these injuries as well. Um, so a focus on ergonomics can improve uh, both durability and hopefully career longevity for us. Um, and ergonomic guidelines, those habitual postural resets, uh, intraoperative micro breaks, uh, thinking about instrument design and innovation, um, and then stretching and exercise regimens outside of the OR, I think can all um, help us to improve, you know, our pain and keep us operating for longer. So I just want to say thanks again for, for having me to speak. Thanks to Dr. Dial and Dr. Lance Allen for helping me with, you know, content and inspiration for the talk. Um, hopefully there's something that we can all take away and implement into our lives. All right. Thanks, Dr. Sheridan. I think a lot of great advice and uh, things that we should be thinking about for sure. Uh, I see Dr. Emmerman's hand up. Thanks. Uh, great talk. I think we'd all appreciate if you could share the links to the video and the articles. Um, my question is, have you looked at what the laws and regulations are and what they have to say about this? Um, like, for instance, if a surgeon is at a facility wants to request an OR table that goes down lower, for example, um, which is a huge capital investment. Is it either really at the mercy of the OR management or are there actually laws that will make it so that they have to provide the um, requested device or instrument? Yeah, you know, I didn't see any laws in particular that, you know, are protecting us or allowing us to ask for, you know, instrumentation or tables or anything like that. There are some programs out there, Duke in particular, where a lot of these studies were done. They Their surgical department has a formal ergonomics committee um, and I think they have been able to to ask for things, you know, to help, you know, us maintain these these right positions or these ergonomic guidelines in the OR. 
Um, but I, I haven't seen any laws in particular that, that would allow us to kind of get better equipment, but I think it's a, you know, an area we could focus on in the future. Uh, thank you. Um, you, uh, one of the points you raised, I think is really important. There's a lot of research in this area that's, uh, in the occupational setting, materials, handling, FedEx, Amazon facilities, things like that. And the key there is data regarding exposure, how do you quantify exposure, posture, force that's generated, and then relating that to symptoms. And so there's a great, I think there's a great opportunity for those who are interested in research to uh, kind of think about our ability to generate those data. We have collaborations with uh, a great ergonomics lab at Ohio State that does this for uh, those other sectors. The other uh, important area is the, um, you know, there's the administrative controls you mentioned, posture, guidelines, uh, uh, breaks, but then also the engineering controls around redesigning equipment. And industry, I know, has a lot of interest in how do you redesign instrumentation um, to help reduce musculoskeletal injuries. And, you know, their interest may be mostly marketing, but I do think there's an opportunity to collaborate with industry to redesign instrumentation to try to reduce industry. And I think our biggest advantage is generating the data that would be the basis for showing those things actually have an impact. So thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think we have the data, you know, the prevalence of injury. I think we just need to connect that with what's causing it. So I think biomechanical studies and, you know, showing which instruments are causing pain, I think could connect those two things. But I think instrumentation, again, is an area that we could really focus on. There's retractors that have not changed in design for years and years. So I think that's an area that, that we should focus on for sure. Joey, thanks so much for a very interesting talk. Um, I was wondering uh, if you came across anything about warm-ups and stretches. Um, athletes, for example, spend so much time about um, warming up and stretching before and in the music world that I know uh, the best that there's, you know, we always say play your scales before you play your big pieces and things like that. So I was wondering if you um, had any thoughts about um, do surgeons do appropriate warm-ups before a full day in the OR? No, it's a good point. I didn't come across anything. Everything was, you know, either intraoperative or you know, around, you know, an OR day either before or after, but nothing specific of, of how to warm up for surgery. You know, maybe we can come up with something. Um, but no, it's a good point that a lot of us kind of just stroll in and uh, without any sort of physical, you know, stretching or warming up of our body. So it's a, it's a good point. Um, Joey, a great talk. I was going to ask how much of your inspiration came from microsurgery? Because I know that microsurgery is a field that talks a lot about optimizing life during a procedure, basically. Uh, it's recognized to be a more tiring procedure and requiring kind of field. And so I'm wondering if you learned anything from microsurgery that you can generalize. Yeah. I mean, I think that's where a lot of the inspiration came from. A lot of these studies were from plastic surgeons as well. Um, and I think they're a little bit ahead of the game and understanding that even a little bit of tilt or a little bit of poor posture, or not having your feet in the right position can affect your performance in the OR. Um, but you know, I think it's an area that we can continue to look at. One other question, um, you know, all the studies, did they compare it to just general rates of back pain, knee arthritis? Cause we know those things happen. And like, was there a relative risk of, you know, the orthopedic surgeon relative to just the general population? Yeah, it's a good question. Not all of them did. Um, uh, the study that Dr. Diab posted act, or that he published actually did do that. Um, they compared um, rates of their spine surgeons to, you know, general rates of uh, lumbar disc herniation or cervical disc herniation and uh, procedural rates for those as well. And they found it was much higher in, in their population. But it's a good point. A lot of the other studies did not did not do that. Yeah. So what Dr. Yep said for those on Zoom is that it was multiple X for everything across the board. Uh and then uh, here, I'll pass the microphone to Dr. Yeb, but um, Dr. Birch had a question. Um, has the correlation between outside work, physical activity, and work-related injury been studied? Um, not that I've seen, Dr. Birch, um, but I, you know, I think it's a good point that a lot of us do physical labor and things outside of the OR, but I, I did not see any studies about correlating the, the outside labor and what we do in the OR. Um, Joey, obviously, I'm... I'm obsessed with this because I'm falling apart. Um, but the one thing that has come up recently has been mental competence. 
um, and whether or not to restrict physicians and whether or not to institute mental tests um, for a physician to continue after, let's say, a certain age. And if you look at, the reason I was talking to Ellen because she's a supreme athlete and I've always thought, think, think of this as a performance profession and you have to perform like an athlete. And we don't get enough sleep, we don't eat well, you know, everything, right? Whereas professional athletes do all that, okay, especially in today's world. And if professional athletes don't perform, they get cut. And yet we allow, we, we can get cut in certain ways, but we like this. But do you think that that is something that might come upon us if we don't respond? Because we are under so much scrutiny as physicians more and more and more. And it may not just be mental consciousness. You think things like this might be on the horizon, so we should try. Yeah, I mean, in the sports world, uh, you know, load management has become a big deal. And uh, for those of you who don't know, it's, you know, athletes now, in order to, you know, ex make sure they continue their high level play into the playoffs or extend their careers, will actually sit out games where they're not hurt. Um, I think that's something that's hard for us to implement into our lives. Um, you know, especially with the busy schedule, it's hard to, you know, block off time if there's no reason to simply just to, to load manage. Um, but I think if, if there's a way that it could be done, I think it could help us. And some of these studies showed that, you know, just doing these micro breaks or stretching or, you know, physical health did help them feel like they were more mentally prepared for the case or, you know, felt mentally better about the case. So I think the two are connected. Was there any difference um, in risk for injury, especially in the wrist and elbow for left-handed versus right-handed surgeons? I know there's like differences in instrumentation and setup. Yeah, it's, I didn't see any. It's a, a really good point, especially with, you know, scissors and, you know, cutting instruments. Um, I, I can look into that, but I, I didn't see anything. Hey, Joey, a great topic. Um, obviously, I kind of relate to it, you know, when you kind of link sports, you know, and athletes into this. Uh, but I think, you know, you start off saying to us, you know, why did LeBron James have such a long career? I want people to kind of really resonate that over there. He had a long career because he actually spent a lot of time outside of sports conditioning himself. Obviously, the games, you know, the, the rules of the games have changed, right? When you look at, like, you know, this analogy for surgery versus sports, the playing of basketball game changed. You have to give space for the three-point shooter right now. You cannot foul a certain way. There's certain ways you know, charge, you know, going to be stopped. So we're changing the game to make it safer for athletes. So we are hopefully if we change some, you know, rules of the OR to make it safer for the surgeon. But why did LeBron James do really well? Or why did Buster Posey, you know, do really well? Uh, it's because what they do outside of the game. And I think that's important for us. Think of yourself as a as a as a you know, as a you know, an athlete, a major league player over there, right? You no know, Bach, you know, like, you know, think about like, you know, a soccer player over there. So uh, condition yourself, and I think that's how you make yourself have a long career. Um, most of us focus on what we do in the OR, but you have to do things outside the OR to prepare yourself, as, as you know, Dr. Dr. mentioned. It's, it, most of them is physical, but it's mental also. Yeah. You have to have breaks. Um, so we have breaks now, right? You know, the, the mental breaks you, you, you mentioned about, you know, in the OR is what the coaches does. You take them out for a breather. For the back, you know, you know, after five minutes, that's what breathers are. I mean, that's you know what you do in the OR. And when you have longer breaks, low management, that's when you take breaks from work. That's what vacation is, or maybe conferences over there. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, we as you know physicians, that we don't have a coach to tell us what to do. But we know sometimes we have to be our own coach. If not, you know, maybe we could be a coach to kind of guide you, unless you want you know us to be a coach for you. But but I think, you know, it's important to kind of manage yourself, you know, over there. But but I would think more about, you know, getting yourself ready. We obviously could change how the game's being played, but we also need to make ourselves ready. Uh, because if you don't take care of yourself, your body well, you don't take your break time to kind of make yourself equipped, you don't eat well, well on a Friday with me, uh, that's a problem with it, right? So I think that's important to see what fits your needs over there. So, but thanks for bringing this topic over there. But I think that those are great analogy and, I want everybody, including faculty and learners, to think about it. It's like, how do you make it better for you? Uh, not working environment, but get yourself ready for the job too, right? Because we're so focused on, oh, you know, we're going to show up. What do you do outside the world? Let's be some balance. Yeah. But thank you, yeah.
All right. Thank you all. And uh, Dr. Sheridan, great job. Uh, great topic and uh, really appreciate your talk. And so we'll see you next week for Dr. Ree, a visiting spine surgeon.